So it's wonderful to be live here at uh, Turbine Art Fair after uh, so many art fairs that have been uh, on, online. And uh, here we are back in a real space. Uh, Turbine has focused on young artists, young galleries, I always call it the nursery, in a sense for the bigger art fairs. And the exhibition that we're looking at is called Off the Grid, which focuses on four artists who have worked in a sustained way over a very long period of time and who have not been part of the gallery system. And that is always difficult for artists not to have an audience. So I have selected Derek and Kumalo, uh, Colin Maswangani, Joni Brenner and uh, Christelle Viviers as the four artists which are the main focus of uh, Off the Grid an exhibition which has an extended space for each of them, which enables us to get a sense of the full body of their work. I'm moving towards looking at uh, Derek and Kamalo's work, an artist who has spent much, most of his life on the Natal coast. And the work behind us is a futuristic uh, image of Durban. It is, uh, it is a composite work which has uh, been worked on over a six year period. And uh, you will see the meticulousness of the way that he works. The precision of the sharp edges of the buildings that are very carefully rendered so that they seem almost hallucinatory. The futuristic qualities also are brought about by the high key color. If you look at this, this beach of umbrellas and the foreshore with uh, the swimming figures, the huge neon uh, billboards, and of course the subtropical uh, trees that uh, he delights in describing in these uh, palm-like forms. When we scan up the buildings, we end up in these amazing radio towers and uh, there is a feeling of, um, of uh, a, a glossy new world, but it is also quite disconcerting. It, uh, it seems almost candy coated, but uh, the uh, uneasiness is a bit like a small stone in one's shoe. And uh, so there's a kind of chirpiness uh, but also um, a history uh, on which this country has been built on migratory labor and on the holiday season. And so, of course, these play into the work. And, and Kumalo comes from a tradition in KwaZulu-Natal with the extraordinary beadwork traditions or the poker work on the traditional carving. So we see this translated into a 21st century image. We move from this high key uh, backdrop of the Durban skyline to look at the work of Colin Maswangani, a sculptor who uh, grew up in the Venda region and uh, his father and his grandfather were both uh, sculptors. So there is a line of, of sculpting in his family which uh, has great depth. Uh, Colin's work looks at, it, it in many ways has uh, deep social implications. It's as though these figures uh, are in the foreground of the backdrop which we've just looked at in Durban. And um, uh, Colin Maswangani's work deals with the tension between living traditionally, uh, the, the tension between the urban and the rural, between two very different value systems, and a way of trying to uh, create a resolution or a marriage between these two. Not either or, but both. And uh, in many ways, trying to integrate a new way of dealing with the future. So we know the the white weddings and this, uh, this notion of uh, people coming together or cultures coming together. And uh, so Colin, maybe you could uh, share with us um, your thinking around uh, the two shall be one and these, these wonderful 
groups of um, of men dressed in in white, what you I think call the purities. I'll start with uh, the two shall be one, uh, which is uh, actually a work that celebrates a union between a woman uh, and a man who are getting married. So according to uh, the Bible verse, which is Mark uh, chapter 10, verse 8, it says, uh, a man will be joined to uh, a, a, a woman and the two shall become one, meaning that uh, the woman will leave her parents and be joined to a man and the man does the same. So in this context, actually, um, it seems as if the woman is the one who is very much happy to, to be married, as many say that uh, uh, women are the more happier to get a marriage proposal from a man than the, the way men uh, uh, <clears throat> seem to be happy. So if you look at the two, you'll see that the man it seems not to be 100% happy compared to a woman who is actually uh, boasting about the ring that she is wearing. So, but according to the Bible verse, it's they, the two are one. What is wonderful, Colin, though, is this Zulu sandal that yes. we all know made of, of, the, of the rubber mm -hmm. and uh, that it's very distinctive in relation to the white shoe and the white, the white western uh, wedding. You know, so in the way that you, you show them, you know, one does feel this marriage also between yes, times that, uh, and cultures yes, and that's true. the transition between them and I mean, the, that her head becomes this hand mm. with the ring on it. And know. the fact again that uh, it seems as if men just want a quick uh, wedding and that's it. They are, they, are, they are joined with the wife, they are married. But with women, it's like they want a very big thing. Some say they are showing off, they just want to show to their peers or maybe to people that uh, in, indeed they, they got married. But I also like the idea that the marrying of the Western and also our traditional way of, of, of doing things, yes, by bringing in the, the, the Zulu uh, sandal uh, with uh, the white um, uh, heeled shoe. Well, the women need to be shown their value and their worth very often with the tradition of Lavola as well. Most definitely. So, you know, I think it's, it is a, that deep social transaction which has been historic within African traditions, you know, and I think in some ways you allude to that. Yeah, most, most definitely. Yes. That they want almost everything to be seen from the, the point where, when the man or maybe uh, the man sends actually a delegation to her house yes. to say we are going to I mean, uh, pay Lobola and then uh, to a point where after paying Lobola then, uh, the, then they have this very big wedding. But with men, uh, as I've seen, you find that very few will want to have that very, very big thing. They just want to have a quick thing, put on the ring, have a kiss, have the pastor blessing them, and that's it. But with women, they enjoy all of that. Yes. yes. Can you talk to us a little bit? About so with, with, with the purities, actually, uh, I've used the color white, which represents uh, to some, um, it represents peace. It represents purity. It represents uh, actually someone who is uh, very good actually. But sometimes it's not like that. But uh, if you bring in again the, the, the two shall be one, this could be the best men uh, who actually are, are with uh, the, 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 the bridegroom, yes. Yeah, so, but on its context, on its own, these are the people who are actually uh, a symbolic of peace, symbolic of good thing as uh, good things as some may say that um, white is mostly associated with, with purity with peace with something good some like to say uh, cleanliness is next to godliness actually i think it's a bible verse so in a way uh, but sometimes you have people hiding behind that uh, they, they, they they may look clean they may look uh, actually true they, they may look like they, they are men of peace, but you find that at the end of the day, they are not <laughs> what they are actually portraying out there. So, but 
in context of, 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 of this 2x, this may be uh, the best main for, 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 for this uh, married couple uh, and, and the way they, they, everything has been arranged. But uh, what I was looking uh, at in its context was more on uh, the, their whiteness, which is, comes with uh, peace, with purity and with uh, something good, actually. Well, it looks to that idea of ambiguity. Yes. This uh, this or that, or this and that, yes. that they both combined. And because I mean, that's we, in the tension in a lot of your work. We, we don't want to look at them as, as, as just white, yep. as, as something perfect. Yes. But we must also be asking ourselves questions mm -hmm. while we, we, we may actually be seeing uh, that uh, actually uh, perfection in them. So, like, sometimes you, we have pastors who actually, we, we, we want them to be perfect, or we hope that they are always perfect, but you find that there are lots of, actually, dodgy stories uh, with them. So, that's, when I'm actually looking at, at, at uh, any work that I'm making, it, it, it is always full um, of questions. It's not, like, just a direct to say, okay, this is purity, this is perfect, this is everything, no. It's perfect, but I wish sure that it is indeed perfect as, 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 as we hope it is, yes. So maybe let's walk across here to talk about the, talking about uh, perfection and uh, thieves. And uh, we know so often the two thieves uh, on the crosses on either side of, of Christ. Yes. And uh, there is a, a humor and a wit and a commentary that uh, is very evident in this work, the way that this uh, priest on the cross looks at this man here. Well, who might be a businessman or? Oh, yes, mm -hmm. so I mean, here you've written, lying on your tithe returns is a sin. Yes. And here, lying on your tax returns is a crime. Yes. And so the ambiguity between uh, spiritual morality and uh, I suppose political or, or, or social morality. morality. Yes. And uh, there is a, there's a seriousness, but there's also humour here, which I think appears in much. Yeah, of that's way. that's true. If if you can uh, actually look at, at the way actually I've uh, attached the these two sculptures onto this cross, you'll see the screws on them. <laughs> so as you know, what they say about actually turning those screws uh, onto one's hand, you imagine the pain that actually, uh, was, what was happening, uh, more especially when uh, Christ was being nailed onto the cross. And to say that, I mean, actually this also becomes some sort of, a, let me say it's, it's a threat. If you don't do this, then this is what we're going to do. It's like we're going to crucify you on the cross. Uh, like uh, in the political um, context, they'll say, okay, we're throwing you in jail. So that's how you're going to be uh, paying for your sins uh, or maybe for your crimes. And then in uh, the biblical terms, they will, you, you're going to actually to, to, to burn in hell. So, and again, uh, uh, for one to be nailed on the cross, it means you are left there to, to die. I mean, so that this is what actually happens. So some way, somehow, yes, uh, just like the similarities that are always, uh, I mean, that are always in our real world that we are living in, and also what is happening in, Bible, in biblical terms, where you find that for the biblical terms, it's, it, you are sinning. But for the, uh, the real world that we are living now, it's, it's you are committing a crime. So, and in all of that, you, 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 you end up paying, yes. you see, yes. Well, talk about end up, end up paying, you know, here one sees um, this kind of receive your blessings. Yes. Uh, that here's the big red tithe box. And um, this looks a bit like a politician, maybe uh, ex-president Zuma. Um, with the two figures and so there's a kind of social commentary and a humor that appears which talks exactly to the the use of money and the misuse of money and uh, the misuse of power and of of influence the sculptures seem to have a teaching uh, or a commentary encoded in them yeah most most definitely Actually, as we 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 are talking about the the tithe box, the tithe box here, uh, it, again, uh, uh, it 
takes me back to the similarities between the tithe and the tax. To say they, they are all actually taxes. Yes. Uh, uh, it's, it's, and the tax as well becomes a tithe. So in a way, you, we're saying that um, uh, the, in, in, in biblical terms, you, 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 you commit a sin if you don't pay your tithe. In, uh, in our real world, you commit a crime if you don't pay your tax. So they are all, similarly, they, they are all kind of taxes that we always have to pay. But in this, uh, yeah, in this work, yeah, it's that uh, this actually, you only receive your blessings if you, <laughs> if you've paid well, you see, uh, which is actually uh, reminds me of uh, where I come from. Uh, uh, my father was, uh, my father is actually kind of a priest, I mean to me though, he was not uh, appointed officially, uh, but uh, we were, actually, yeah, we, we used to go to church while we were still young, uh, until I got older and then continued, I mean, uh, believing in Christ and, but what is happening today, it's, it's something that I really don't understand where you find that people have to pay lots of money in order to receive their blessings, you see. So that's why, that's why I've actually, I said, okay, there's a pastor who seems to be offering himself to bless these people. But also on the other hand, there's a, a tithe box, mm -hmm. of which tithe is good. It's what actually the Bible says, and those who believe in it, uh, when they pay tithe, there's a blessing that God promised, and then they do receive it. But... Uh, you find that it, 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 it goes beyond that where people are, are, are expected to pay, to pay actually uh, lots and lots of money in order to receive more and more blessings. Whereas God says, uh, the little that you give, if you give it out of your heart, uh, then you will uh, actually uh, receive from me. Mm -hmm. But then you have pastors who say, if you give more to me, which is a way of enriching themselves, kind of a scam actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but... Uh, it's 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 the, what the, the, the way it's all about of, um, enriching the pe the priest the the priest yes <laughs> yeah. the, the the pastor so yes. yeah so uh, well actually we somehow I mean had to have our eyes opened against yes. that to see the scam and also to see the real thing because I I do preach about tithe but we don't preach the scam that is happening in yes yes, yes in church yes. So uh, Colin Maswangani's work looks really at the political and the personal landscape uh, within his community. And when we uh, come to the work of another artist, Joni Brenner on the exhibition, we see uh, another deep form of dedication as an artist, looking at the nature of likeness. Um, Brenner's work has focused on portraiture over many decades and um, her, her practice has been to um, have a sitter uh, who she has worked with for over five or sometimes seven years. She's not interested in social portraiture. She's also been interested particularly in painting the skull because it is, the, it is really the scaffolding of the face. And um, Brenner has worked uh, consistently painting the same object or the same person over and over again to engage the intimacy, the sense of likeness, which is not photographic likeness, but a much more deeply seated uh, likeness which has to do with the, um, the capturing of the interaction between the self and the sitter. What uh, has occurred in the work of this particular exhibition is um, looking at the fragmentation uh, of image, uh, be it in the previous portraits, uh, or here in the case of a series of works which look closely at herself and her own body and um, in, in many ways coming to terms with that as an external and an internalized image. And uh, Joni, uh, maybe you could talk to us about the earliest 
of the images which start to deal in some ways with your own body and the, the, the female body, the embodiment of self. Thanks, Carl. It's been so nice actually listening to you talk about my work, having watched me become an artist over decades, mm -hmm. and just sort of listening to you speak about the relationship between portraiture and skulls and how that also encapsulates and embodies a relationship between life and death and time passing. But also I think embedded in those ideas, which I think is very much part of this show, is the um, is the fragment or the the, piece, the small sections um, that that are possible to capture in a painting, and I think that's um, that's why I've got these models over. You said five to seven years, but some were over twenty years, <laughs> again and again coming to the studio to try. I think all portraiture um, is really an act against loss, and it's an it's it's trying to capture the whole person. And, and I think I, I, I know I can never do that, but I stubbornly fight against that. And I keep on trying to, to, to create uh, like an, an ambient likeness, which is a word that you've used about my work before, or portraits That's that so are... so different to a, a, a shutter So different image. to a snapshot. Yes. So, so different it's a, to a snapshot. It's a, it's, a, it's a process of finding and becoming, and that the fragments, in a sense, um, the, the space between here. There's a lot of space in between. Is filled by the particular detail. In and the viewer yeah. who's got to complete it. So with these two work, well, with this work, <laughs> with this work, but particularly with the top two, um, you know, I always date my work, but in these two, there's a very specific date and it says, it's not just a year, so it's the 31st of May, and it was the death day of Louise Bourgeois, so it was, the t it was when I heard that she had died, it was on that day that I made these two paintings and uh, uh, maybe a year or so later I made this other part, the third body part, and eventually reassembled them and put them together to try and reconstruct or, or, or build up something from, from bits and pieces and in a way it, that also speaks to the idea of memory and, and mentors and kind of a creative lineage, people that we've looked to and, and that we lose all the time and, and find our way through all of this life and death and loss. So in a way, these paintings, although they were made um, at least 10 years ago, they felt to me to contain the seeds for for this body of work here, which as you say is me instead of looking and scrutinizing and never letting go of the person in front of me in the studio, I've actually now turned that, that very, I think very um, exacting gaze on my own body and, and it's been a, actually a huge surprise because although I've worked with watercolour, with the skull work um, in many, for many years, somehow those paintings feel like there's a bit more struggle in them and it's not to say that I feel particularly peaceful or optimistic but somehow these works and maybe it's more to do with the sense of absence and presence that I think is there with all the death and the loss and the life and the cyclical nature of portraits but when I think about maybe particularly these two works which are maybe at the other end of the spectrum in this in this body of work because they 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 are certainly much larger than the than the piece that we've just looked at but they're also um, I think are an embodiment of absence and presence in a way they're almost not there they're so light and so ethereal and so um, fluid fluid and it's almost like <laughs> It's like they're absent, but I think they're very present. I mean, I and think yeah. what, what, what is interesting about their presence and absence, when we do look at the bourgeois uh, uh, pieces here, that the fluidity uh, of the um, the fluidity of the paint of, of how that um, pigment collects yes. has got a gravity to it, and that yes. your depictions of of the human of your body are not made out of fleshy paint, no. but in fact are about the 
fluid and the, uh, the fluid nature of the body itself. And you know, some of the works are extremely visceral. Yes. So it's, but they're ethereal and visceral at the same time. And, and that's what's so powerful about them. And I think also such a hard thing to capture in watercolor mm. because to have something that feels structured and kind of robust in a way, even while it's ethereal in watercolor, which is a medium that's so unlike oil paint or clay or any of the other mediums that I've worked with where you can actually shape and mold them. This medium is much more emotional, I think, because the watercolour and the pigment pools and seeps and bleeds and gathers and, and kind of does its own thing. And it's a question of actually just trying to control that and manage that. So in a way, they're very much about managing the material as much as they are about that um, trying to capture a body in motion or a body changing. No, absolutely, and then at the same time, you know, pushing watercolour to the scale is really dramatic. I mean, using those huge Enormous Chinese brush. brushes, oh. and it, you know, it is a bodily gesture. It's not a, a fine motor control, you know. So it is, it's, it is like sp spilling uh, onto the surface, literally, physically, yeah. and uh, controlling. Yeah. The, the fluidity of the paint itself, which is, you know, it looks so easy, but it is incredibly complex in the sense of control of the medium, which uh, I think in the whole exhibition, uh, one feels this process that uh, evolves from one work to another, that there is a repetition as there is always in your work, but that each has a very, very different mood to it. Mm -hmm. And that it is an, the exhibition is an, uh, an accumulative experience. So that um, one moves from one work to another, it's the same body, but every time it is different. Mm -hmm. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, it has a sense of gravity here, the way that this section, the torso, sits within the girdle here or that the this feels almost menstrual in the way that mm. that color moves and so there is a candidness uh, around looking at self and looking at um, the, the biology of being yeah. which I think is so profound within the work. Christelle Bavez has worked quietly and intensely on a body of work for many years. She initially studied here in South Africa, then at St. Martin's School of Art in London, and then did the Sotheby's course, which took her to China. She is deeply involved with the process of making, which is not separate from her life. And it is uh, in this process of folding, of uh, staining, and of unfolding, that these images are made. She works using the principle of active uh, and passive, yin and yang, and the works are very philosophical in many ways. They have a, a, a strong process-driven uh, quality to their imagery, as you can see behind me here, where this work is, uh, the material is sewn and stained. So the pigment moves through the surface um, from one side of the material to another. So the works, uh, concertina, they fold, they are stretched, and you will see this large work behind us is, how many meters is it, Christelle? I think, I thought it was four, but I think it's seven. Seven, a seven meter work which is folded and refolded um, to take the form that you see behind us here. In front of us, you will see a series of works which are also stitched and stained. And these um, uh, fold open and are very often either shown flat or are placed on screens uh, on wheels. So Christelle has had a a very peripatetic life as a student, 
in London, she worked at St. Martin's School of Art in the tiny spaces and felt the need for her work to be able to move, so it could be stored or moved. And when we look at uh, many of her works, you will see that they are carefully placed uh, on uh, wheels and that uh, there is something about the dynamism uh, of the image within the space it itself. The, uh, the transitory nature of the work not being nailed to the wall, but literally uh, to flow out into, into the space. Christelle, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about the process of, um, of impression and folding and of the, the energetic transfer uh, which particularly interests you. Yes, it's important for me, I think, how we live. Um, but it's not about how the other person lives. You start with yourself. And it's about the imprint, I think, um, that you leave behind when you leave. And somebody once said the best imprint you can leave when you leave is no print at all, meaning that you should have tread so light that you should not have hurt anybody in the process. But having said that, there's also a beauty to the way that when we engage, um, I leave a mark on you and you leave a mark on me. Um, and those marks are often not even seen because they are energetically made. Mm. Um, the YYP is about, or the yin yang principle is also very much about that positive, negative, about that exchange that happens and we, um, we're not even aware of it. So through my work I try and bring a consciousness to that, um, but also a consciousness for myself in terms of when I need to rebalance I would stitch. Um, I would bring things together. Um, the unfolding, it's often dictated by my space. London gave me a big um, gift, I think in that sense, where I learned to appreciate space in a very different way. Um, because of its constraint. Because of its constraint. Um, and uh, you, I had the choice, do I either start working in video, because it would be easier, um, or do I actually start negotiating um, my space and my body within that space. And by having done that, um, I understood another component of my own body and it also brought me a, a great awareness of the amount of migrant migrants within London. I was living in Camden Market and um, every morning you had all those people in the market. It was a massive storage room where everybody would roll their works out, their, their, their days living yes. um, on clothing rails. And clothing rails became my walls. If I needed a wall, I set up a clothing rail and I hang a canvas or a piece of paper. Um, and then if um, I need to, and I could move it. Um, so um, if I didn't have money for public transport, which I didn't have, um, I could carry all these works and I could fold them. So, but it's also about this whole process of um, contraction in life. Um, you have to contract in order to expand. If you think of um, conception of a child, becoming that narrow space and then growing and then being birthed. So all the time I think we, we have to at times go small, um, but when you go small it doesn't mean you disappear. It means you go inside and you actually grow and then at some point in time you actually expand. So the folding in that way plays many well, it's, it's like uh, the way a flower unfurls, or a leaf, or this incredible sense of life force that moves out beyond its conception. And then maybe what we should do is walk across to have a look at the pure energetic uh, photographic works of yours. So Christelle, you were talking about the staining and the folding and this is a, a series uh, of photographs which have this uh, almost auric field-like quality to them and in many ways one doesn't know what they are. And 
it slowly emerges that they are the stains from the works that you have made in your bathtub and that it is the the line of color on the edge and it is the it's the dye in the water and leads to a, a whole body of work and um, you were talking about the impression left at, uh, of the body and uh, it's a bit like the they remind me a bit of the of the shroud of Turin you know that one feels that there is a body there but you can't see it it's an it's an emanation and um, so uh, the making of work in your bathtub or folding works in the, your tiny studio or room talk to this creative process within the confines but at the same time having the mobility you know so we see it in this uh, in the sculpture of yours which uh, is pleated which in some ways is very feminine. Uh, this feels like something very feminine here, uh, as well as the, the wheel. Could you talk to us a little bit about the piece? Um, the pleats are definitely allow for a softness, but the actual material is copper wire. So um, it's, quite, it's, quite a, um, it's quite a inflexible, or not inflexible, but it's quite a tough material to actually um, work with, but copper within the alchemical process is also very much a feminine, um, a, a feminine material. And um, the reason why I use this work, um, yes, it plays on myself as well, but this work does make quite a, a, a big statement also about um, feminine energy within the world. When I speak about um, a feminine and masculine, I don't mean gender. Um, if I talk about that balance, at the moment we have um, the wheel goes back to that migrant, um, that whole play of, of, of migration and forced migration in so many um, ways. Uh, the shocking thing is um, after World War II, um, they said that it was the highest percentage of people displaced in the world and that humanity should never go through that again. Mm. Um, by 2016, we have more than doubled that amount. So, since World War II, we have we've we've taken note and we've recorded history, and we have made no progress. So, um, I'm asking myself whether revolutions are the evolution, or what is the what leads to what what leads, leads to, to it. That. So, the wheel is that, and for me, the evolution in this piece, I call it yin. Um, yin balance and yin is the feminine part of the energy exchange and it's just um, you know an interesting thing is um, that they've uh, discovered with the starting of um, COVID that um, the world uh, spend uh, 1918 um, million dollars on um, developing uh, or, or the, the arms deals um, th that's what was spent on that. So there was an increase in 2020 on um, budgets for military. And, and um, here we are in lockdown. So the feminine thing is about, I've painted this uh, sheet with battleship, uh, with... Um, uh, battleship grey. Battleship grey. <laughs> and um, so I'm balancing this uh, yin balance is about compassion for humanity that we lack mm. I think and um, it's it's bringing that in in a way where although this looks very feminine there's also a strength to it but there's also a flexibility to it there's a poetry to it and um, there's a there's a grace to it and and none of those components are of, often thought of as strong and but I think there's strength in that um, and so it pivots on this very yang block Thanks. But, uh, you know, maybe just to jump in again, of course, there's a very strong art historical language here around the ready-made of Marcel Duchamp yeah. and, uh, you know, the shift that happened at the time of surrealism, that there does feel almost a surrealist-like quality to the piece. And, you know, it's, it feels like a feminine version of Duchamp's Bachelors. So, uh, you know, your work does deal with these processes but at the same time you are extremely versed 
in the language of historic and contemporary art, which I think is very evident in the works. And we see it so clearly when uh, you look at the the sense of fluidity in the other works and the very contained systematic nature of a piece like this, which is, is held in place. Uh, it also has the wheel, so it has to do with the sense of precision and heldness, but at the same time, this ability to move. And uh, so it is those two poles that you philosophically talk about, the static and in a sense the, 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 the fixed and the, and the fluid, uh, which is at the center of your work and that uh, your work really seems to focus deeply on self, but in a, at the same time is very broadly philosophical, which is its great strength. I think it's important for myself to find the balance between you need a certain amount of form and inflexibility um, in terms of being anchored, being grounded. But grounded doesn't mean you're not able to move with, with, with what happens. And that ad adaptability is very important. Um, what you mentioned about, um, again, the wheel as well, and um, the migratory thing, and then also uh, anchoring it in, in art history. Um, those things feed in, uh, all of those things you know, I, I, I it's osmotic in many ways. Yes. It's synthetic. I mean, yeah. your work is synthetic yeah. in terms of your life, in terms of your understanding of the history of art, and yeah. of uh, your response to where and how you are. Yeah. And or if you are not anchored, if there's not a form of a frame, you can't move. So I, I'm, I, I, the rigidity is about finding form that still allows you to move and bend, but not to become. Fixed. Richard, yeah. Fixed. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.